Welcome everyone to the Healing Place Podcast. I am your host, Terry Welbrock. Excited to have you here with us, listening in, and also excited to have another wonderful guest. I will be doing some introductions in just a moment, but just wanted to welcome you here first to this space filled with motivation and inspiration and healing stories. All right. So, tell us about your story and, um, yeah, in your organization. Uh, well, I'll start with a little bit about the organization first, if, if that's okay. Sure, absolutely. Um, I started Empower Survivors, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. It's um, set up to support survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Uh, educates the public on issues pertaining to childhood sexual abuse and uh, really trying to kind of put out the information on adverse childhood experiences and how that affects uh, not only survivors but their families and community at large. Uh, also, the we try really hard at the nonprofit to do our part in aiding and prevention. We believe that by giving voice to childhood sexual abuse, we can help kind of break the silence and, uh, and all of the taboo around the issue of childhood sexual abuse. So <clears throat> I started that in about 2013. It uh, started out as an online uh, group actually on Facebook. I started, and it wasn't Empower Survivors at that time. What I did was I connected with a man by the name of Robert out of the UK and uh, him and I decided we were going to start a group called Innocence Lost. It was a Facebook group, um, closed group. And that was uh, kind of a support group that ended up being for all survivors of child abuse and trauma. So it didn't matter if it was emotional abuse, neglect, child, you know, physical abuse, whatever it was, um, it was a place for people to come. Um, after that, I realized I, I kind of wanted to also have something that was kind of geared more towards childhood sexual abuse. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so at that time, uh, I started thinking more about starting a group that was for sexual sexual abuse, and that ended up being Empower Survivors. So we started out. As a closed Facebook group, I realized after a short period of time that um, more and more people wanted something that was also offline. So then uh, what turned into, or what started as a closed group, excuse me, <clears throat> ended up morphing into a group that um, met offline at the local library. We then switched to another building that ended up um, be in a place that was for um, a lot of AA groups, Al-Anon, and that sort of thing. And they were nice enough to open their doors up to empower survivors. They believed in what we were doing. And, uh, and so I began peer support groups there. Um, in 2016, uh, so, you know, and by that time there had been a couple of years. In 2016, we ended up going uh, and and became an official 501c3. And now we have office space in Stillwater, Minnesota. So we do online groups, offline groups. We try and have classes. Like we, we had a uh, writing, writing through your trauma class not too long ago. We try and have different workshops. And then every year we have a annual conference called Giving Voice uh, in Stillwater, Minnesota. So, which is actually going to be happening in November here, uh, with the hopes of bringing um, survivors of childhood sexual abuse together under one roof at least once a year. And uh, my hope is that every year that grows and more and more survivors <clears throat> can, you know, be empowered to give voice and also come and, and gather support and find resources. Oh, sure. Like the whole um, hashtag <laughs> Me Too, you know, movement, mm -hmm. I just found so powerful uh, and inspirational because it was that 
that sense of connection and that sense of community, like you're not alone. And when you have that, that feeling of not being alone, there's just an empowerment to that. Absolutely. Uh, yes. And one thing I have to say about the Me Too movement, I think there was a lot of male survivors that just didn't feel supported with that. And uh, I think more and more we're hearing, you know, more stories about male survivors. But yes. um, I think the Me Too movement was a great, wonderful thing. Um, I think it kind of a little bit missed the mark on childhood sexual abuse. Um, I think when it started out, it was more geared towards adult rape, which is a yes. horrible, horrible thing and definitely, uh, you know, something that we need to draw attention to. And, and uh, but I really, um, my heart is not only for adult, you know, adults that went through rape, but really to support, you know, the boys and girls and, and now men and women that were sexually abused in childhood. And, and because I think it is such a different dynamic when um, you're sexually assaulted and raped in childhood, I think, um, because your brain isn't fully developed like an adult, there's, it's, it, there's, a, there's a different, different types of things that come into play because of it. It's, right. We really try and support both men and women, um, boys and girls. Yeah, well, and everything right now that's coming out of Philadelphia, you know, I'm Catholic, and so um, there's almost a shame stigma of being Catholic right now with all that's coming forth again. Um, you know, it's, it's an embarrassment. Uh, I, I worked uh, in a rectory as a teenager, mm -hmm. and um, one of the first priests that was accused happened to be at that rectory. Well, I didn't know, you know, those boys that he was bringing in. Um, yes. Meanwhile, the religious education director was, you know, sexually um, accosting me in the basement. So um, it's just, again, yes, to, to give voice to the boys as well as the girls, anyone, any child, any human who has ever been violated. Um, Absolutely. Just what a beautiful mission. Um, that is to to help survivors and help help heal yeah Very yeah cool. it's you know the you had mentioned uh, catholicism i too grew up catholic and and i think for a lot of uh catholics um you know i i think it is hard with all this information coming out it is very hard to be catholic knowing that certain things were covered up and, and hidden and, and sometimes destroyed. But the positive that I see coming out of this is that, um, you know, people are really starting, you know, there's a discomfort there. People are coming forward and people, I think within the pews are even starting to understand now how huge of a problem that this is and whether it's a catholic church a protestant church uh synagogue wh whatever it is you know there's just no place where sexual abuse doesn't um affect people. right you know we get these ideas that it's strange words or it's it's this or that and it's you know the abuse is going on in places like places of faith and at babysitters and school and Oh, right. Families and, you know, yeah. mostly women families. And, and uh, yeah, so it's one thing that I think, even though it's a horrible, horrible thing to see coming out of the Catholic Church, I think it's also a huge blessing because truth is coming forward. Yes, and shining a light that that's, it, it, it's needed to be shined for a long time. Um, yeah. You know, I hear... People say, because um, I'm that person that puts all my stuff out on Facebook. Like I just, uh, in 2013, I just started dumping it all out there. And, you know, some people were just like, you know, oh my gosh. And others were reaching out to me like, oh my gosh, that this happened to me and this happened to me. But, um, and I sort of lost my train of thought where I was going about with, with, the, oh, with putting the truth out there. Um, it's just, again, been very empowering for like people coming forward and saying, um, you know, yeah, it, it, it did happen. Oh, and what I was going to say was, you know, they're saying 
oh, it's so much worse now. And I'm thinking, no, it's just that we're now more cognizant of it. We're more aware of it. Exactly. Um, it's coming to light where it used to be back in the seventies when everything that was happening to me, you know, we didn't talk about that. And if we did, you know, if you did bring it up, it was just pushed away. But now social media is just, it's letting it come forth. Um, and while the circumstances are horrific, it's just a, it's just a, a great thing that it is coming forth. It is. And it's, you know, I almost feel like we're just on the edge of a tsunami of, of, you know, the stuff really coming out. I mean, I can remember years ago, I didn't start dealing with uh, the sexual abuse that was done to me until I was 42 when I was triggered. And uh, at that time, I thought there is no way that anybody could know that this happened to me. I, I was devastated. I had no idea at that time just how prevalent sexual abuse was and uh, basically how, you know, sexual abuse affects um, children um, throughout their whole life. And I, you know, I just didn't realize um, what this epidemic was, how it affected the mind, body, and soul in this type of thing. And, uh, and, and as I started learning, and as I started shedding the shame, that's when I started to really give voice to and, and uh, you know, like you said, you know, throwing stuff on social media, I think, you know, there were some people that were like, what is she doing? How do right. you talk, her and talk about this? Yes. And, and not only that, but to all of a sudden, you know, it was a shock to my family. It was a shock to kids I went to high school with. Yes. Um, my own husband, uh, who's now my ex-husband, but he, yes. <laughs> he, uh, you know, even him, he's like, I've been with you for 25 years and never knew that this was something that, you know, happened. And, and, uh, and that's part of the reason too, that I started Empower Survivors because, um, I guess, uh, you know, going back here, we kind of started talking about Empower Survivors, but the reason that that ever got started was, um, I was actually in church one day and, and I got the thoughts of, of starting this, but I was, you know, at the time I was in therapy twice a week. My life was, um, pretty much, I had been, I guess, uh, to go, to go back, if you don't mind, I kind of, Oh, sure. Go on, tell your story. Took our story backwards for a minute, but, um, you know, I just, you know, growing up, I don't think that there was ever a conversation about any type of abuse. You just, like you said, you just didn't talk about things. No. And especially uh, growing up in the Midwest, um, <clears throat> you know, to show kinds of emotions and, and that sort of thing. Or, I mean, there just wasn't an atmosphere that you even felt that you could come forward with something like this. And I think when it happens so young, um, you're not quite sure, what do you do? Um, right. What is this? You're not even, you know, I think for a lot of us, we weren't even sure what to call what was done to us. So right. um, it was in my own healing journey. Um, like I said, I was triggered when I was 42, ended up in ICU for 40, or I mean, uh, for two days. Uh, because I had a heart rate that that uh, kind of spun out of control and they couldn't get it down. So I was, um, you know, came in thinking I was having a heart attack and dry heaves and all this. And it was really as though Pandora's box just kind of busted open. And after that, the flood of flashbacks and truth of thoughts, uh, just an upheaval of of your life and feeling like you got gutted and, and you're thinking, how does something like this happen? And uh, getting into therapy twice a week and then hearing just um, all the things that go along with what happens to kids when they're sexually abused and never tell. Um, I think that was, that was, really when I think my life started to kind of begin in ways because the healing process 
and it was during that um, time frame, I was actually up in my upstairs bathroom. I had three kids. Um, two of them had hit the ages that I was when I was sexually abused. I had several different violators. Um, and uh, two of the kids had, had uh, turned the ages that two of my most prevalent uh, perpetrators were. And so that was the trigger, but to pretend that mom was normal, as you know, and to pretend that mom wasn't having flashbacks and all this other stuff. I mean, I was up in my bathroom hiding and it was after a flashback, I had had a flashback, I was sick to my stomach in the, in the bathroom with the door locked. And I'm thinking, how do I go down and face my family? How do I pretend that everything's okay? And I actually had uh, my therapist at the time uh, on my cell phone texting back and forth um, because the person was kind enough. Uh, that was part of the therapy. I was allowed to uh, be able to text in moments like that. Um, to kind of help ground at the time. And, uh, you know, I thought, if this is happening, if this kind of stuff is this prevalent, I mean, I sure as heck didn't ever know about it. And um, I thought, if this kind of thing is happening and there's other survivors out there in the world that are sitting locked in their homes because they're isolating themselves, they're all of a sudden triggered and their whole life is you know, as though they're being gutted. I mean, what a horrible, horrible thing. Right. And, and so there was part of me that felt this deep sadness, but also an anger. And I thought there is no way that I ever, no, I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> That's all right. I, I, I got to hear you just a second ago. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, I thought there is, how knowing what I know now, I mean, in that moment where I was in the bathroom there, I thought knowing what I know now, knowing how devastating this is, finally having a name for all the symptoms I had had throughout my life, understanding that there were certain choices made because of unprocessed trauma. Uh, I just thought, this is horrible. I have to, I, I can't, knowing all this information, I can't sit back and do nothing. Right. And somebody's got to start talking about this. So that's really when I started going full bore with Empower Survivors. And, uh, and at that time, I ended up calling um, a local, um, ed, uh, what am I trying to say here, a uh, reporter from the St. Paul Pioneer Press and I put out, I, I talked to a reporter, I said, you know, this is something that's um, happened to me and we need to get this out there and we, you know, would you consider doing an article? Which was kind of surprising because at the, you know, a little bit before that, I thought there's no way anybody can know that I was sexually abused because- Oh, right. Yeah, I mean, I spent I, I, I spent a lifetime um, basically feeling like, a, excuse my language, but I, you know, a whore and a dirty, dirty individual. I was, was, I was so going to say that to you a minute ago when, when you were talking about the very, back when you started telling your story, um, that I remember as a child thinking to myself, one, do I have a tattoo on my forehead that That's says target, but two, taking on the self-blame because oh, yes. this is happening. To, what am I doing to make this happen is what I kept thinking to myself. And I never once thought, like, and I, and I just, you know, again, through four years of therapy, I did EMDR therapy mm -hmm. for four mm -hmm. years to process um, the trauma. And again, getting a label of CPTSD was huge for me. Like I finally could research something and yes. know what this was and <laughs> symptoms and, you know, and how to start to he the healing process. So that was wonderful. But yeah, taking on that shame and that guilt, if you will, of I was somehow causing this to happen. 
Absolutely. I just had a conversation with a fellow survivor last night because they asked, they're like, how, how could this happen to me so many times? And, and I, you know, I explained to her, I said, you know, anybody goes through those thoughts and especially if you had several violators and this, this became a pattern in your life and, and, uh, you know, and also in the people that you pick to date. I mean, even even yes. that. I mean, yes. it's hard to know, you know, gee, is there something innately wrong with me? Am I a bad seed? And and that's so common among survivors. And I told her, it's like, no. What the problem was, which is really kind of a sad thing, but the problem was, most kids, they want love. Right. And a lot of us were, I mean, we were good. At, well, most, well, all of us, because no kid is ever to blame. But little children, they just want to be loved. And a lot of us maybe weren't um, getting that type of love at home, maybe weren't being seen or heard at home. So somebody um, with the skills of a predator, yes, I mean they're going to zone in on that. So it isn't us. It's oh, it's that vulnerability energy. I I say it's an energy that mm -hmm. children who are vulnerable, neglected, you know, hurting on, on an emotional soul level, mm -hmm. predators, they pick up on that energy. Um, and yes, and I, I agree. And again, it's not saying that I was responsible, but it's saying because of the circumstances I was growing up in, in an alcoholic home and just mm -hmm. so much of the stuff that was going on. Um, yeah, that I was giving, I was just an extremely vulnerable child as so many are and the predators, whoop, they, it's just like the hone in on that. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah and it's, and it's sad because there's so many adults that, you know, that I meet with. And I know uh, for me, the shame and blame was just oh, yeah. and the self-hate and everything else. And, and now, you know, I, you know, I'm way further along in my journey, uh, you know, but I think it's a lifetime of healing. I don't think we get, you know, healed in six sessions or although we wish yeah. we did or that sort of thing. But but I think it's real important for survivors to hear that, you know, it wasn't their fault. That it, you know, and, and how many times did survivors or did we as survivors be told we're too sensitive or we're too this? Uh, yes. That, <laughs> you know, and... Yes. Uh, by some, you know, by people that we tend to, at least I used to tend to, to gravitate towards um, those who were unable to love. And yeah. so those who are unable to love would then turn my emotions and my empathy and my, yes, I am an emotional person and I, I do cry at the drop of a hat. Um, <laughs> so it would, be, it would be turned around on me, you know, like, why do you cry so much? Why are you so emotional? Yes, because mm -hmm. I'm human and I'm finally dealing with all this. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And thank goodness that some of us do have this high empathy and, and sympathy yeah. because it's, I, I think that's where you find a lot of the healers now. You yeah. know, I mean, we're taking, taking your pain and turning it into something positive where you're helping not only yourself, but other people. And that's yes, awesome. well... And kudos to you for doing it because, yeah, I, I, I was so relating to what you were saying in that once I knew what I knew, I was like, there's no way that I cannot try to make a difference in children's lives. Absolutely. Try to impact the world in some way, um, small or large, um, and just start putting, putting my voice out there. Um, and I told somebody yesterday in an interview, I said, um, you know, I think as we all start to join hands, more of us, which is why I love Ace's connection, is that I there's, there's oh, just an incredible amount of trauma, not just trauma survivors, but trauma warriors, as I like to say, mm -hmm. um, whether they're working in the field or they're a survivor or both, 
we're, we're, we're starting to raise our voices together and that voice is just getting louder and louder. Um, Absolutely. Hard to ignore when you get that many people. I mean, yes. what did they say? There's over 400 billion. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, over 400 billion survivors in the United States, I think. Crazy. Is that the right number? I heard, yeah. I, I... I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Yeah. I, mean, I just know, I just know that when I've seen the numbers of like what, you know, four out of 10 or however many mm -hmm. kids still going through it and which just absolutely. baffles me that it is still going on. That it's still, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, to crush those ideas of that it isn't just strangers, that majority of the time it is people that are known and trusted mm -hmm. and, and uh, it's happening within our own families and, uh, you know, or, or something of that sort. I think, uh, especially in Minnesota here for a long time, we had the idea, I don't know if you um, had ever heard of Jacob Wetterling, but he was a boy back in the 80s that was abducted here. Um, him and uh, three, or him and two friends were all bicycling. He was abducted and, and, uh, for, and was never seen again. And for years, you know, I think we grew up with this idea that if we let our kids out there, they're going to be stolen and we'll never see them again. Um, you know, thankfully and unfortunately, within the last couple of years, um, Jacob was located. He was, we found out that he was um, uh, sexually abused and raped and was killed. Um, but thankfully, his family was able to, um, you know, have, well, if you can even have closure or something like that, I don't think you can, but, um, you know, they were able to get some answers. But you know, we still have the idea that it's strangers and it's, it's not, it's these right. people groom, not only the kids, but they're grooming all the adults around them. And sure. And that sort of thing. Yeah. Mine, mine were interesting because it was some were, well, some were strangers, but it was, um, neighbors. And so, again, I think they were close enough to us. You know, the first one, when I was five, it was a teenage neighbor. When I was nine, it was a teenage neighbor. But then my, my choir director, which was a repeated offense, and, and yes, yeah, so and he ended up years later found out, you know, that it wasn't just me, but other, other girls um, that went to our school and church. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? And, and, uh, you know, the same thing is, you know, mine started out as a sitter as well when I was young. Um, and then, uh, you know, when I was 14, uh, 13 and 14, there was a, a couple predators that one was a, um, a friend's older brother. And it was, a, you know, started out at a slumber party where, you know, you're just staying overnight and they have an adult sibling and, and uh, next thing you know, you're um, having things done to you that you don't even know what to call it or what's happening. And you're, you know, it's, it really forms a lot of different thought patterns in your mind that aren't, you know, negative thought patterns. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, my last deal ended with a rape when I was 17. And, uh, you know, after that, just closing the door on childhood and never thinking about it again. I, you know, I think we have this idea if we don't think about it or close off from it that it's not going to come back to us. Then. Right. I think they say the average age for uh, sexual abuse survivors to start dealing with this is in their um, mid 40s. Uh, I think they say uh, 42 actually is when uh, a lot of survivors for the first time will begin dealing uh, with the sexual abuse done to them. Isn't yeah. that just, I mean, that's mind boggling to me because I mean, I had gone through, uh, similar to you, um, you know, had ended up having a date rape, losing my virginity to date rape at 16. 
Um, and then, but then I had these bank robberies that I was involved in and a gun was held to my head in one and a coworker stabbed with a hunting knife. And then Ooh. three months later, same, same, they weren't caught. They came back sure. um, and murdered my coworker. Wow. I am so sorry. Well, thank you. But I mean, I just remember thinking like, then I was like, oh my gosh, you know, so that's all we dealt with in therapy was these bank robberies, bank robberies, bank robberies. And I had stored all that sexual abuse. I had just stored it away in a little box. I just, absolutely. And so when I finally ended up in EMD or therapy in 2013, so let's see, how old would I have been five years ago? So I was like 48. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's when we finally took all those boxes and just dumped them on a big pile on the floor. Like all of it came out. Oh, and I just remember thinking, oh yeah, I guess that probably would have caused some damage. That pro we probably should deal with this stuff. Because to me, it was, I, I thought it was all like all this trauma was like trauma was bank robberies and murder and you know, all that. Um, Absolutely. I can remember, I can remember looking my therapist right in the eyes and saying, I really don't think it affected me. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. And, and have as a therapist, jaw just drop. And I said, I don't even know if you call, I don't know, maybe it's not sexual abuse. And, you know, at that time, I mean, you know, talk about denial. I mean. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah. Just, you know, and, uh, and, and then as you go along, um, at a certain point, you start to really feel what you had put away for so long. I disassociated. Um, Me too. Yes. And uh, quite a bit in, in a lot of things. And, and I think, you know, at a certain point in recovery, you know, I was adamant about I have to remember every single thing. And, you know, I, I really thought, I mean, when I first went into this, I thought, okay, I want to get this done in six sessions, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, because I thought I don't have time for this. I have three kids to raise. I'm freaking out. I'm insane. I, I need this wrapped up. I can't, right. and, you know, years later, you're, <laughs> you're yes. realizing just how silly that thought was. Right. Or not silly, but you know, it's that denial and not understanding and then pretty soon realizing that wow all that unprocessed trauma led to teenage pregnancy led to drug and alcohol abuse led to future um exploitations and right. rapes and and uh in miscarriages and, and physical illness and mental illness and 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 then it's like wow we got to get we got to do something yes we could not agree more so who who's your target audience like if you could reach as many people in the world with with your with your mission and, we, and your goal who would it be child of sexual abuse survivors okay you know not only them but you know i mean that's what I want for empower survivors. I, I want it to reach out to and to empower people out there to get help to 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 realize that they're fearfully and wonderfully made and they deserve to have healing and all this garbage that was thrown at them that that there are people that care that you know, I see you, I hear you, I love you, and, and I want you to find healing. And that takes really, really, really hard work. It takes vulnerability. It takes transparency. And most survivors, you know, unfortunately don't have the support of family or friends. They've been abandoned. And I want them to know that there's somebody out there that truly does care and that has that believes in them and that they that they don't have to suffer in silence yes part of my what that what i say to people is so many times in in blogs or on my website i'll say i believe in you because 
Absolutely. I think people need to hear that. I think oh. people need to hear, I believe in you. And you I do did. this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I had to be reminded all, I, I remember yeah. asking therapists all the time, do you think I'm nuts? I'm crazy. I've, right. I've fallen off the edge. And, and they're like, I <laughs> <"Well>, believe in you. <laughs> <laughs> and I need to hear that over and over and over. And I need to yeah. know why they believed in me. Yeah. And, uh, and so my target audience with that would be that. But also my target audience would also be, you know, this is a big one, but government and politicians. I mean, let's start doing the right things here. I mean, in Minnesota, we were able to, the politicians went after, um, opening up beer sales on Sundays. We never used to be able to have liquor sales on Sundays. This became a big thing in Minnesota was to pass liquor so people could, oops, I apologize. Oh, you're fine. Um, so people could, um, you know, be able to purchase beer on Sundays. And I thought, you're kidding me. Why are we, I mean, we still have statute of limitation you know, in a lot of states, and yes. oh. so I, I, my heart is in vocalizing to politicians and the government that hey, we need to start understanding childhood adverse experiences and realize that most survivors do not tell, and if they start to open up, they're opening up when they're 40, 50, 60 years old, and a lot of times the curtain law current laws aren't based on the understanding of what trauma is, how it's stored in the brain, how it affects the survivor, right. and how saying that, okay, well, you have up till 10 years after you are raped or abused to say something. Well, we have a lot of people that are sexually abusing kids and getting away, away with it. Right. And and uh, it's a murdering of the soul. And if we can have open, you know, if we can pursue murder cases, um, we really need to, you know, have the statute of limitation across the board uh, in every single state. Yes. To be able to abolish that and, and get these survivors some support, some help, some justice. And make sure that these people that abuse kids, whether it was 50 years ago or this afternoon, that they're going to pay a price for that. Right. And we need them off the street because one perpetrator could abuse hundreds. And I think we're seeing that in the church. Exactly. You know, exactly. but we can't be blind and think that, you know, this is a Catholic church problem or, uh, you know, the Olympic problem with, the, you know, Olympic position that was doing right, the same right. thing. I mean, this is across the board in every race, every economic status, every family. And, and so, you know, I, well, I, and I, like you're saying, I don't think a predator, you know, assaults a child and then says, okay, well now I've had my fix. I'm done. Like mm -hmm. they're, they're going to continue with that pattern and they're going to continue hurting kids um, until, until they're caught and, and it's and an end is put to it. So, so yes, I agree. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think when I meet with survivors all the time, you know, the majority of them, they're perpetrators. They, you know, most of these perpetrators have never been charged with anything. Right. They'll right. never see the inside of a courtroom. Yes, sadly. Well, and that leads, one of the questions that I, I offer up is, you know, are there any myths or facts that you want to clarify for listeners? And I think one we just kind of talked about, um, you know, the fact that so many uh, predators continue to walk the streets, um, yeah. either because of, yeah, because of statute of limitations and, and, and or the fact that, um, you know, we're still teaching children and, and young people to have that voice at a younger age and to, to deal with um, their trauma. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think some of the myths out there, um, especially is um, if you're, uh, you know, I think there was a belief that if you, 
you know, most people that were sexually abused will go on to sexually abuse other people, other kids. And we know that that's not true, but there's that myth out there. And especially I think for our male survivors, a lot of times they, they have the stigma of people thinking that because they were sexually abused that they'll go on to sexually abuse other kids. And we know that that's not true. Um, you know, there are, you know, there's a certain percentage of perpetrators that were sexually abused, but the, but the majority of kids that are sexually abused will not go on to sexually abuse others. Uh, another myth would be that if you were a boy and was sexually abused, that, um, you're, you know, that your perpetrator was gay or, or something like that. And, and we know, I mean, it, it's this isn't a homosexual problem. This is right. the power in rape of kids, and uh, or the idea that little boys um, can't be raped. You know, there's still that that thought that well, boys can't be raped, and that somehow they aren't as affected as as much. I think um, thankfully that myth is starting to be. Um, busted up and, and, and we're getting more information out there about our male survivors. Um, but, you know, all those things, there's that stigma, um, all those myths and, and stigma that go along with, uh, you know, sexual abuse. I can remember even as, uh, you know, as my children were little and changing their pants I can you know their diapers at a certain moment I thought you know if I clean my little girl's bottom is that right you know, am I going to be looked on as a predator I mean and it's like you know obviously now I know the answer but back then you know I was scared because you know I thought gosh if somebody knows I was sexually abused are they going to think that I'm going to go out and abuse their kids and mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it, you know, breaking through some of those um, myths and, and uh, also thinking another myth is that this only happens in uh, poverty stricken areas. Um, you know, I think we both know and, and uh, that this isn't just happening in poverty areas. It happens in every Right. Uh, you know, economic middle class, middle class white America. Absolutely. Midwest, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, so what resources have you utilized? Is there any anything in particular that, that helped you along your healing journey or helps you with helping others? I think the biggest thing for me was finding good therapy, which is I think really, really hard. There's a lot of therapists out there that claim to be to know trauma that really don't, uh, that maybe had a sexual abuse survivor come into their um, counseling office, but maybe they haven't had extensive training in, in trauma and adverse childhood experiences. But I think therapy for me was key. And I think uh, another, I just want to add in there for every survivor, I think, you know, what worked for me may not work for somebody else, uh, but for me, therapy and going into the intense therapy uh, twice a week for therapy, um, I was definitely afraid to go to a type of group therapy. It took a long time before I would even, um, you know, the therapist had said, you know, let's get you in some group therapy. And, and at the time, I thought it was just that the therapists were sick of me and didn't want me around anymore. You know? <laughs> and, and then I find out, no, it's because to be with other survivors and to sit in a room where you don't even have to say anything and they understand you, that's healing. Uh, so getting connected into a peer support group was was huge and uh, you know so that was very healing to me reading um, understanding certain behaviors that it you know that some of the stuff the lifestyle choices that I made uh, growing up 
to learn, you know, reading and educating myself on sexual abuse and trauma and the dynamics of the brain and how everything works. Uh, knowledge is power. And, and so for me, education became huge in my healing process too, because it, it helped me to understand that, you know, I, I wasn't just this piece of crap, that there was reasons why, um, it, you know, I became, uh, you know, kind of, I, I wouldn't say, I don't want to say delinquent because uh, I, I don't think that was it, but I became very rebellious and, and sexual and uh, looking for love in the wrong places and, and uh, teenage pregnancy, drug and alcohol. And, and so education to be able to see that those were actually kind of, symptoms that came on from mm -hmm. unprocessed trauma. Yes, absolutely. You know, that's yeah. why it's like so important we catch these kids when they're young. So then somebody can, you know, uh, you know, instead of us reaching people at 70 years old, you know, being able to get a hold of these kids young and say, no, you know, you are worth something. And right. this abuse does not have to define you. Right. Um, so education was key. Um, and uh, also taking people out of my life that were negative. Yeah, uh, removing which, that toxicity. Yes. Oh, yeah. And I didn't even know in, in realizing learning boundaries. Oh, I mean, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I just was going to say, what's that? Yeah. I, I remember. I, yeah, exactly. What is that? Like a boundary? What? <laughs> oh, I can remember the therapist saying, you know, you, something about boundary. I said, I, and I can remember at that point looking at them and going, what the hell are you even talking about? Oh my boundary? gosh, I had the same exact conversation with my therapist <laughs> when she said it was about my then best friend who we were just extremely toxic relationship. And I said, she said, you really need to put some healthy boundaries in place. And I remember looking at her like, and I said, well, one, what's a healthy boundary look like? And two, how do I do that? Exactly. Like, I, I don't even know. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. you know, and so, you know, that was a huge thing in yeah. my healing. And, but really, um, uh, taking, taking negative people or people that weren't supporting me, uh, removing them from my life, which was hard because that meant people that I truly, truly loved had to be, you know, I had to distance myself because they just weren't going to be people that would empower, build me up. They were going to keep me sick. So I had to keep distance. And, and so that was a big thing too. And just learning all uh, the dynamics of everything. I, I kind of went overboard and became like a sponge going to conferences and educational things, anything that I could to try and better understand myself, better understand trauma. You know, I just had to suck up everything. Oh my gosh, you and I, we're, we're, we're like, <laughs> anyways, you're talking, I'm like, yes, yes, and yes, and yes, and check, check, check. <laughs> I mean, people are like, oh my gosh, you're like a walking encyclopedia of trauma. I'm like, because I've read every book on brain plasticity. Yeah, and, me too. You know, like, I, I watch videos, and I do conferences, and I, there's a free summit, man, I'm there. And, <laughs> that's, you know, so that's, I, I'm I, the same I, way. Yeah. We're trauma geeks. Yes, trauma <laughs> geeks. But it's, it's, but it's empowering. And yes. yeah, that's part of that healing. Because, you know, here I sit holding one of my little, you know, like my healing stones that I have. And Love it. I've got my meditative candles lit. And I just, any anything I can do, all that stuff that helps me um, stay calm and focused and, and in this beautiful healing place. Yeah. And it helps you stay in the present. And yes, that's being in the now. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I agree. <laughs> All right. We are, we are run, well, actually, we went over time, but that's so cool. And I love it when we go over time. That means we have awesome stuff to talk about. But I want to throw at you because I love this question and it's my favorite. 
I'm going to get thrown at everybody. If you could meet anyone in the world, dead or alive, who could help you with this journey of yours, who would it be? If I could meet anyone in the world that would help me in this journey? Yeah, dead or alive. Oh, boy. I know. It's such a good one. <laughs> I love this question. Oh, that's tough. <laughs> Better alive, better understand this. Yeah, to help you along your journey. Either personal or professional or both. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Boy, I'm taking a while, aren't I? That's all right. That's all right. I would have to say, now this could change because part of me would like to touch base with my grandmother again but um <laughs> you could say too i oh i can yeah uh, so i would say uh you know i grew up in a very christian home uh catholic home and uh and and my faith was always very 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 strong and there's part of me that uh through all of this where that's been a little damaged yes so for me i think uh because i have come to question certain things uh in my faith walk i would i would probably say jesus christ and the the reason i'm saying that is because I used to be able to say I truly, truly believe, and there's doubts, but if I could, I'd sit down and say, what the heck? What the hell? <laughs> yes! I was going to say it for you, but I was like, no, don't say it, Terry. <laughs> Let her say it herself. But I was going to say, I, I've had that, what the hell? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to sit down and, yeah. then, you know, let's... Uh, Let's talk about a few things here. Right. right. And somewhere along the line, something got kind of screwed up here. So, yeah. <laughs> so what can we do to, to fix this kind of thing? Right, right. So that and and uh, also, I you know, as far as living, I would love to connect with some of these people that were renowned in the trauma, um, the trauma realm. Yeah. Uh, some of the uh, ones that are really on the front lines of, of um, you know, understanding just how trauma is affecting and, and that sort of thing. Probably touch base with some of them, too. Yeah. Great answer. I love it. All right. Last question. What is your dream job and are you doing it? I would say that I am doing it, although the only problem is <laughs> I don't have a paycheck, and people think I'm completely off my rocker. Um, I don't get paid. Yeah, I don't. Me, yeah. right? Oh yeah, I mean, people. Yeah, they think you're just insane, and and I'm like, you know, if I was gonna get into something to to make it rich, make myself rich, this wouldn't be the thing to do. <laughs> right. But right. that's my dream job, and I guess also my dream job would be to take what we know and uh and be able to provide to to start an organization on a type of ranch setting where uh we can really help a lot of survivors that would be my that would probably be my dream job that's that's a, i mean that would be really cool yeah yeah for like people to come for retreats and stuff and so oh forth. absolutely oh how awesome I sign me up. I'd be on your list. All right. That well, we better get going then. All right. Get that thing started so you can come on out. And... All right. That's beautiful. <laughs> well, how do so? How do people get a hold of you um, if they if they want to reach out um, or find uh, out more about your organization? They can check out our website at www.empowersurvivors.net. Uh, they can also uh, reach me at 651-300-9180. They can email me at empowersurvivors at gmail.com. And uh, they can uh, 
find out more about the organization on the website and also about our upcoming conference in November, they can uh, check that out, purchase a ticket, and come on into Stillwater, Minnesota and visit. All right. <laughs> Do you have uh, any social media pages at all? Oh, that's a good thing. Uh, Facebook. If you go on Facebook, we do have a public page, um, Empower Survivors public page. We also have several groups that are closed Facebook groups um, that are peer support. We have a peer support group for adult survivors of child sexual abuse. We have a support group for um, um, survivors, families, and friends that are just trying to understand a little bit more about the survivor in their life. Uh, so you can find those groups on Facebook as well. Also, you can find uh, my LinkedIn page, Elizabeth Sullivan. You can uh, find that out there. We do have Twitter. I started a YouTube account under Empower Survivors. So several different things on media there. Awesome. Well, wonderful. Well, it has been an absolute joy to have you on air with me. Thank you for your insights and everything you do to shine a light into the world and, and bring this to light. So. Well, thank you. And be, so can I ask you one question? Sure. Yeah. All right. I know we're going over, but That's all right. who would you meet with? <laughs> I, I would meet with Mother Teresa. You, you know, She's another one. She, yeah. you know, I always said I was going to be like Mother Teresa. Of course, <laughs> everybody laughed at me because I said I think you would have gotten kicked out of convent. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's another one, Mother Teresa. I, I, I followed her since I was a little girl. Yeah, me too. And I just, I, I think I admire her because she was always she was she was in the trenches, which is kind of where you and I are. You know, we're. We've made it through, but now we're taking what we've learned and we've taken our healing and we're taking that survivor that we have our warrior stuff on yep. and we're going back down into the trenches and holding our hand out. Now I'm going to get emotional and we're giving people a hand to hold and helping pull them out of the trenches. Oh. And I think, I think she did that same thing. And I, and I think what you and I are doing, um, you know, that, that I don't want to say we're like her, but we're emulating Absolutely. what... What she was all about. So, absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much for answering that. Yeah, very cool. Well, thanks for asking. So, <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to do a quick little sign out and then I'm going to stop recording and then we'll chat for just a second and send you on your way. So, okay. everybody, thank you for joining us. And uh, until next time, be sure to be gentle with yourselves. Take care. <laughs>